Hello, welcome to the inside of a Haval H6 GT. It's incredible how many of you wanted us to review this car. So here it is, a review on this car. <laughs> this car costs 40,000 Rand more than a normal H6. So is it worth it? Should you spend your money on an H6 GT? Well, stick around, because I'm about to tell you. Dream, search, drive. Cars.coza. No matter how big or small your car is, you can still save 420 per month. Budget, the official insurer of good South Africans. So a top spec normal H6 super luxury will set you back 589,000 Rand. This is 629,000 Rand, which is also 40,000 Rand cheaper than the new H6 HEV, the hybrid that's just come out. So what do you get for your money? Well, let's start here. You don't get a lot more power or torque. Uh, yeah, you get, you get five more Newton meters than a normal H6 2 litre and you get five more kilowatts so this car looks pretty sporty but yeah pretty much under the bonnet the power bump is negligible as far as I can tell and you can certainly not feel it <laughs> so so it, it, it's a very sporty looking car but it's sort of sporting credentials are only pretty much skin deep so I hear you saying, Chiro, well, what is the point of this Havel H6? And I've been thinking about that a lot over the last four days that I've been driving this car. And I think I have an answer. So underneath me is the H6 platform. It's an all-wheel drive platform, two liter turbocharged four cylinder up front going through a seven speed dual clutch gearbox. And while this car is entirely based on the H6, weirdly, it's actually slightly larger in every dimension. Now I can't quite work out why that is if it's just down to say different bumper design which it does have it's got quite a different front and rear bumper or if there's actually some different metal work going on here and one of the things that makes it challenging reporting on Chinese cars is that out of the mothership in China they don't put out press releases so the South African armor for Vol sort of does a fair job in trying to communicate some of the more technical aspects of the car to us journalists but let's put it this way the information is very thin on the ground and so we sort of pull information from around the world there's a lot of australian reviews which help but the real nitty-gritty of this car is actually quite difficult to get hold of unfortunately So for instance, really useful information like say this car's zero to a hundred time is pretty hard to find. But luckily we've got one of those draggy things and my colleague Dave Taylor took this car out and did a zero to hundred test and we got a time of 7.5 seconds. Now it might be slightly faster than that in ideal conditions or on better fuel or whatever the case might be, but that's the testing that we got. And that sort of gives you a frame of reference as to how fast this car is. It's nowhere near, say, a Golf R, for instance. It's nowhere near, say, a uh, X4 with the big three liter motor or an X4M or anything like that. It's not as fast as even, say, a Golf GTI, but, in my opinion, for what is essentially quite a large car, 7.5 seconds to 100 is not too bad. Where this car feels a little bit lackluster is in sort of the mid-range torque. So it actually gets off the line quite well. But for instance, if you are going for an overtake here and it beeps constantly, it's sort of, okay, we're getting going. It's, it's sort of build speed rather than kind of leaps and yeah there's plenty power there to overtake traffic and keep up with traffic but it's not it's not sports SUV power 
But Chiro, I hear you say, doesn't this car have driving modes? And you would be correct. So you've got normal sport, eco snow, race sand and off-road. So sport is like vaguely interesting and for some reason it switches on the hazards quickly when you select sport. But the one you want is race. So that changes the dials, it changes the sound of the exhaust, it changes the gearbox setting as well to be more aggressive. And now you have a car which I can't quite decide if it is faster or if it just sounds faster. And I also can't quite decide if that is a mechanically different exhaust note or if it's just being pumped through the speakers. Can you hear that? So that is race mode. And that, in my opinion, is completely pointless. The best way to drive this car is to leave it in comfort and just let it do its thing. Another aspect of this car that makes it not so much a sports coupe is the suspension. So it manages to be quite crashy and quite wallowy at the same time. So look, it's not bad. It's, it's very much livable. But if you're pushing on and you want to sort of go through a corner a bit hot, yeah, you're kind of on your door handles and then you go over a you know manhole cover or a pothole and it's like gunk. So you sort of get the worst of both worlds. However, I will say that when you're cruising, when you're out on the highway and you're just sort of making progress, it's a very comfortable car. The ride quality is really good. The noise insulation is really good. There's very, very little noise and vibration and harshness coming through into the cabin. It's actually a lovely car to tour in. And if you think about what GT means, Grand Tourer, you know, then, then that's what this is pretty much but again not a sports coupe and then one more thing that's not great in this car is the throttle modulation when you're in stop start traffic so the the way a dual clutch gearbox works is that it only engages a clutch when you apply some throttle so it doesn't creep like a normal automatic does and that's all dual clutch gearboxes that's how they behave so to get around that what Havel have done is engineered into the software where when you take your foot off the brake and you're stationary the car will apply a little bit of throttle so that it creeps now this in theory is a good idea in practice not a great idea because you come off the brake the car accelerates a little bit then the car in front of you stops then you get back on the brake and so there's a sort of this effect while you're crawling in traffic and it's not very enjoyable i may be being a bit dramatic but it's it's true it that's how it, it feels like that And the reason I'm trying to highlight what it isn't is because I think this car's admittedly great looks might fool you into thinking that it is something like a baby Lamborghini Urus or a baby X4M or a baby GLC 63 or a baby Audi SQ5 because it's not really those things. What this car is, is a really comfortable SUV that looks great that holds tons of appeal and looks infinitely more interesting than a normal H6. And that, I think, makes the 40,000 Rand worth it because this is just a sexier car. It's a much nicer car to look at. It gets way more looks than a normal H6. The other day I went to a concert and people were just pointing at this thing in the parking lot as I drove past. You know, I don't, people don't really point at normal H6s, do they? So what they've absolutely nailed here, and I think what you're paying for, is the different look, the different front bumper, the different grille, the different body kit, the fact that it looks a bit more butch and a bit more mean on the road. That's where your money is going. And I think one of the reasons people buy cars is for status, for that sort of look at me factor. And that's what this car has in spades. And that for me actually makes it quite a successful product. 
Welcome to the interior of the H6 GT. Now what impresses immediately is the quality of the materials, the design, the fit and finish, the build quality. It's all really top class. The seats are a highlight for me, although they sort of look a bit like a wetsuit, but this is very high quality Alcantara, nice contrast stitching. Even the side bolsters have like a carbon fibre sort of pattern to it. I suppose maybe one downside is that the interior is a little busy. I mean, look at the door here. You've got plastic, chrome, Alcantara, brushed aluminium, stripy plastic, more Alcantara, yellow stitching, carbon fibre, shiny aluminium, plastic, leather. It's like they went to the boss and they were like, what fabric do you want on the door? And he just said, yes. <laughs> make it all, make it all happen. <laughs> For some reason, also, the people at Haval HQ don't like buttons. This is all you get. And most of these buttons are actually mandated by law. For instance, your hazard button has to be a physical button by law. So everything is in here. And as I was showing when I was driving the car, down to your sport mode and all the rest of it. So you really do have to familiarize yourself with the infotainment system. That's your sort of home screen. Some of it is very intuitive. For instance, if you touch anywhere on the aircon controls, you get all of your aircon controls. So that's pretty useful. It's actually, it's a really good system once you get used to it. It's a bit finicky maybe but definitely not the worst I've ever worked with. It's a bit weird that the screen that's in front of you is much smaller, but that also has a useful amount of information. And I think it's important to say that everything you're looking at here is included in the purchase price of 629,000 Rand. There's not a single box you can tick. So panoramic roof, how does that open? There we go. That's included Android Auto, Apple CarPlay, wireless charger, it's all included in the purchase price. And then a quick tour of your convenience situation. Because it's a drive-by-wire gearbox, there's nothing under here. So there's a big storage area with some USB ports and a 12 volt socket. Huge storage bin in here is very useful. Two drinks holders, a nice little spot to put either your key or your phone. That's actually quite useful as well when it's not charging. And this heads up display as well. Full suite of safety systems, adaptive cruise control, lane keep assist, and six airbags. Sorry, seven airbags actually in this model. Uh, one more than the standard you get in the Havel H6. Now, the first time I sat in the back seat of an H6, I was pretty impressed by the space. It's very spacious back here. I mean, tons of knee room, tons of headroom as well. But the sort of design of the seat, there's something just a little off for me. It's not the most comfortable back seat I've ever sat in. So very spacious, just maybe, you know, not particularly great for long distances for adults, but it is well appointed back here. There's two USB ports for charging your things. You get a nice little reading light as well. The panoramic roof on the normal H6 goes back much further. And I suppose it's shorter here because the mechanism for the blind has to go somewhere and then the sloping roof begins over there. So you don't get that sort of spacious feeling above you that you'd get from a normal H6, but it's still a pretty big roof. You've got two drinks holders in here and a proper third seat belt, as well as Isofix child seat mounts on both sides of the car. Now, of course, the H6 is best used as a family SUV that has some sporty pretensions, but because they've chopped off half of the back of the car, you do lose some of the practicality. The boot itself is actually quite wide and quite deep that way, but if you want to get things below the parcel shelf, then it turns out that the car is a bit shallow. So let's do our scientific cooler box test. And if you look at that, it doesn't even fit under the parcel shelf. I think you could probably stretch it over, but then I would bump our light out of the way. But yeah, that illustrates that you don't have too much height from your boot floor, unfortunately. Underneath here though, is what all South Africans do seem to like, a full-size biscuit from Linglong. 
and you might notice that there is a fire extinguisher that is a legal requirement in China. So it arrives in South Africa fitted with a fire extinguisher. The chairs do fold 60-40, but they're very far away. I can just reach over there. Yeah, there we go. And then when you open that up, you get a massive load area. And then as mentioned, electronic tailgate as standard equipment. Quite a big concern for me though with this car is the fuel consumption. I've seen an average as high as 14.4 on this car when driving really conservatively. Now with some highway driving, we're down to the best figure I've seen over the last four days, which is 11.6. Now, Aval claims 8.4 to the 100 for this car as the combined average, but I haven't got anywhere near that. Now, what we have heard from some members of our audience who have bought Haval H6s is that over time, the fuel consumption does get better. And this car is very new. It's only done 2,800 kilometers. So I'm hoping that everyone who's written to us about this is right and it does get better. But right now, based on my experience driving this car, and I must say conservatively over the last four days, yeah, you're looking at like 12 to 13 to the 100 here, at least for your first few you know, maybe first 10,000 Ks of ownership. So there's only one spec of Haval H6 GT to choose from. It costs 629,000 Rand and it is fully loaded. It's a super luxury electric tailgate, panoramic roof, heated seats. I mean, the options list just goes on and on. Android Auto, Apple CarPlay, everything is standard. And yes, it has become this refrain that we've repeated many, many times over the last few months that we've been driving a lot of Chinese cars. And that is that these cars are incredibly well priced but i want to add to that because i don't want to say that this Havel h6 gt just comes in at a really cheap price what i want to add speed pump is that at that price this feels like really really good value like this is a lot of car and not just a lot of car a lot of good car for your money i would be more than happy to drive this car every single day and if you look at it compared to say the established competition it's hundred and sixty thousand rand cheaper than the equivalent Volkswagen Tiguan and almost certainly better spec then if you look at something like a BMW X4 I'm not kidding it's five hundred and one thousand rand cheaper than the cheapest BMW X4 you can buy half a million rand and is an X4 half a million rand better than this? No, it just isn't. Look, this car is not an X4. It's never going to be. In the same way that I am not George Clooney and I'm never going to be George Clooney. However, if you are looking to MC an event, I'm gonna be quite a bit cheaper than George Clooney and you're gonna get a very similar result. Thanks for watching. Now, did you know that Cars.Coza has a brilliant app? It's actually one of the most popular apps in South Africa, and that's because it's actually really bloody good to use. You can save your favorites. So while you're shopping, you know, if you're taking a couple of weeks to shop, you just save your favorites so you don't lose them. And it's also a brilliant way of finding new car specs and pricing. It's incredibly detailed. I use it all the time. The link to the app is in the description below. You can get it on iOS and Android and it's in the Huawei app gallery, I think it's called. Yes, that is what it's called. Cool, alrighty, and I'm done. Good? Okay. You deserve insurance that doesn't faff around. Budget, the official insurer of good South Africans. Cars.coza.